Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another edition of the Delicious Legacy. I'm Thomas Dinos, and let's dive in into another archaeogastronomical adventure. Now, this is something I've explored before, but uh, since then, I found more evidence and more information about uh, the spice, the herb, the ingredient, the ubiquitous element in ancient Roman and Greek cooking. So, without further ado, let's dive in and explore the history of Silphium and Asaphoetida. In the year 635 BC, roughly 2657 years ago, a lone pentecotter vessel, an earlier form of the Hellenic warships called triremes, is pulling out of the port of the scorched, parched and almost lunar landscape of Thera, the ancient town on the Cycladic island which we now call Sandorini. Without much fanfare, the single ship departed. Its passengers, including the king of Thera, Grinus, fall on, hoping for a miracle. It has been seven years of drought, and the inhabitants of this now unassuming Greek settlement are desperate. The buzzing metropolis of Akrotiri, a Minoan era city during the Bronze Age, in the glory days of Sandorini, is long gone and forgotten. It has been almost a thousand years since the colossal volcanic explosion that wiped much of the Aegean civilizations of the time. So every memory of the glorious past was erased and buried under tons of hardened volcanic ash and lava. Venus, son of Isanius, a descendant of Theras and king of the island of Thera, went to Delphi to offer a hecatomb on behalf of his native city. On Grenus consulting the oracle about sundry matters, the Pythoness gave him for answer that he should found a city in Libya. When the embassy returned to Thera, small account was taken of the oracle, as the Therans were quite ignorant where Libya was. Seven years passed. The citizens are rightly concerned and desperate. Grenus, alongside Corobius, a dealer in purple dyes, are sailing down the Mediterranean Sea, south of Crete, trying to reach the shores of Libya. Pythia, the oracle of Delphi, who positioned above the chasm in the earth, threw sulfur and mist-filled plums of smoke with her honey-singing prophecy, commanding them to found a settlement in the land of Cyrene. Well, little did they know that this city, this new Greek colony, which much later during Ptolemaic era would be a part of the famous Pentapolis, and which was founded in a fertile land in the foothills of Akhtar Mountains, would be a successful, powerful and important trading Greek center. A massive trading hub and city center connecting the ancient eastern Mediterranean basin with the riches of the west. Its importance was manifested in the demand for the native plant silphium, used as a medicinal herb, but most importantly, as a cooking ingredient all over the ancient Greek world, and later, Roman too. Silphium, the topic of our episode today. So valuable was it for Romans that almost 500 years from uh, this story, the state treasury allegedly stored it alongside gold and silver. We know Greek and Romans fell in love with it. They absolutely loved it as a cooking ingredient and as a pickle. And they used it in almost every single recipe. But no matter how hard we try now, it seems we can't find it. What was it? And where is it now? Together, in this episode, we will explore one of antiquity's most enduring mysteries, the rise and fall of Silphium, the disappearance of which we can count as the first documented man-made environmental disaster. At least we can take it as a lesson for us today. Um, maybe not as a story, as a true story, word for word. Maybe as a parable, perhaps, right? 
as we shall see later on, uh, we cannot trust everything the ancient writers uh, wrote and said. Cyrenaica, the country itself, was a land colonized by the ancient Greeks in what is today Libya. East of Benghazi, itself with long history, as it was another Greek colony founded around 525 BC, as uh, the name was Esperides or and later Bereniki, and south of Crete. Cyrenaica was considered by the Greeks as a sort of terrestrial paradise. This was partly owing to the force of contrast, as all the rest of the African coast along the Mediterranean, from Carthage to the Nile, was barren and sandy waste, and partly to the actual fertility of Cyrenaica itself. It was extremely well watered, and the inhabitants, according to Herodotus, they had eight months of collecting the produce of the land. The maritime places first yielded the fruits, and then the second region, which uh, they called the hills, and then lastly those on the highest part inland. So we have the following passage from uh, Herodotus. Next to them are the Gilgamai, who inhabit the country to the west as far as the island of Aphrodisius. In between lies the island of Platea, which the Cyrenians colonized, and on the mainland is a harbour called Menelaus, and the Aziris, which was settlement of the Cyrenians. Here the country of Silphium begins, which reaches from the island of Platea to the entrance of the cities. This people is like the others in its customs. You notice there the mention of Silphium. Every single writer ever who has visited Cyrenica, today or in the past, hasn't failed to speak with enthusiasm of the remarkable fruitfulness and natural beauty of this vast garden. It is probable that of all bordering the Mediterranean, none has a more luxuriant, fresh, cool climate, heavy with summer dews and winters feeding scores of springs and mountain brooks, and a prevailing wind from the north-northwest. The plentiful rain washes the gardens and the broad fertile plains which surround the town of Cyrene, except on the side of the sea. It is cut off from the mountains by fields of sand and shallow lakes of salt water supplied in part by tidal overflows. So one of the chief natural produce of Cyrenica was a herb called Silphium, a kind of Laceriptium or Asafoetida. It was said to be fattening for the cattle, rendering the flesh so tender and it was a useful appearing for man, for its juice too, when kneaded with clay, a powerful antiseptic was obtained. The silicium formed a great article of trade, and, in Roman times, the composition above mentioned sold for its weight in silver. It is for this reason that the silicium appeared always on the metals of Cyrene and on its countless coins. Silphium was very firstly mentioned in Greek literature in the early 6th century BC by the famous Athenian statesman Solon, one of the seven wise men of ancient Greece. He is also considered as the first innovative lawmaker that set the ground for the creation of democracy, the governmental system that made Athens powerful and granted the city its fame all over the centuries. One of the legends has it appearing seven years before the founding of Cyrene, as we've seen earlier. This is not worthy, as this is the only recorded dating of the introduction of a new food anywhere in the Mediterranean world, before late Hellenistic times, obviously. And this uh, must say something of its perceived importance. It was a wild herb and not able to be farmed, yet it rapidly became an indispensable ingredient in the menus of the ancient world. Perhaps indigenous nomads introduced it to the Greek colonists, uh, and then became a valuable commodity. And then, as they say, the rest is history. Well, what else do we know about it? The plant was almost certainly related to fennel or celery, and it was eaten principally in the forms of opus, which is dried sap, and kylos, a stem. These general words of dried sap and stem were appropriated into the trade of silphium and came to denote how it was eaten. Romans, on the other hand, they liked to eat the whole root and stem, sliced and preserved in vinegar. 
Dioscuridis, a late Greek uh, prominent physician of the Roman army, says about uh, silphium. The Cyrenaic silphium, even if one just tastes it, at once arouses a humor throughout the body and has a very healthy aroma, so that it is not noticed on the breath or only a little. How was it used? As we've heard earlier on, farmers fed their sheep on a diet of silphium to make them have a tastier meat. Silphium fed sheep were the ancient equivalent of the highly prized and highly priced Wagyu beef today. According to Pliny, if an animal should ever come upon a promising shoot of silphium, the sign will be that the sheep, after eating it, rapidly goes to sleep, or else a goat sneezes rather loudly. Silphium seems to have almost countless uses. The stems were roasted, the roots w- were eaten with vinegar. The sap it produced, known as lacer, was grated over foods and became the must-have condiment across the ancient Greek world. Hmm. Alas, a rumor had it that silphium uh, died out in the first century AD, so give it take a few thousand years ago. Or we hear what we want to hear and we see what we choose to see from the ancient writers. Let us check Pliny's passage in his natural history. For many years now, it has not been found there. The single stem found in living memory was sent to Emperor Nero. That's what we know from Pliny. The whole actual paragraph on the plant goes like this, though. Next to this, the Serpitium claims our notice a very remarkable plant, known to the Greeks by the name of Silphium, and originally a native of the province of Cyrenica. The juice of this plant is called Lasser, and is greatly in vogue for medicinal as well as other purposes, being sold at the same rate as silver. For these many years past, however, it has not been found in Cyrenica, as the farmers who hold the lands there on lease have a notion that it is more profitable to depasture flocks of sheep upon them. Within the memory of the present generation, a single stalk is all that has ever been found there, and that was sent as a curiosity to Emperor Nero. For this long time past, there has been no other lasser important into this country, but that produced in either Persis, Media or Armenia, where it grows in considerable abundance, though much inferior to that of Cyrenka and even then it is extensively adulterated with cum, sacopenium, or pounded beans. Notice that Pliny doesn't say the silphium was extinct. He just says it hasn't been found in Cyrenica in a long time. Indeed, he even says that another variety of silphium was cultivated in Persis, Media and Armenia, which is roughly modern-day Iran, Armenia and Afghanistan. But that it wasn't as good as the kind of as the one from uh, Cyrene. In reality, the question if it went extinct is still quite open. So the main problem is uh, that uh, we haven't we haven't got any goats sneezing while eating it anymore. Strabo, the Greek geographer, who was more or less contemporary of Pliny, writes: the country also produces silphium, whence the medic juice, as it's called which in general is not much inferior to the Cyrenaic juice, but sometimes is even superior to it, either owing to regional differences or because of a variation in the species of the plant, or even owing to the people who extract and prepare the juice in such a way as to conserve its strength for storage and for use. As we see, silphium was very popular and also was a popular medicinal plant too. So Hippocrates, the uh, the father of medicine, writes, When the gut protrudes and will not remain in its place, scrape the finest and most compact silphium into small pieces and apply it as a cataplasm and apply a sternutary medicine to the nose and provoke sneezing. And having moistened pomegranate rained with hot water and having powdered alum in white wine, put it on the gut, then apply rags, bind the thighs together for three days and let the patient fast only he may drink sweet wine. If even thus matters do not proceed properly, have a mixed vermilion with wine, anoint. Also Pliny the Elder writes uh, 
also lists a number of alleged medicinal uses for silphium, which include the use as a contraceptive, but even he admits the primary use of silphium is as a food item. Rather amusingly, also Pliny the Elder attributes all sorts of miraculous effects to the eating of silphium, claiming that it purges the body of all ailments. This indicates that by Pliny's time, the properties of silphium were becoming rather mythologized. Also, Pliny writes in his natural history, the stuff I told you about that the Greeks uh, used to feed it, the cattle with it, and at first it purged them, but afterwards they would grow fat, the flesh being improved in flavor in a most surprising degree. After the fall of the leaf, the people themselves were in the habit of eating the stalk, either roasted or boiled. From the drastic effects of this diet, the body was purged for the first 40 days, and all vicious humors being effectually removed. Obviously, stories about these alleged miraculous effects of eating silphium probably arose um, in a similar manner to how modern claims about alleged herbal uh, cures arise. Such all the such all the all too common claims of um, various kinds of common herbs and spices that can cure cancer or whatnot. In the Roman world, silphium was primarily sought after as a food item. Take as an example the surviving ancient Roman cookbook Terre Cochinaria by Apicius, which we talked about extensively on episodes 9 and 10 of the first season, and also I will give you a recipe at the end of the podcast, and which is believed to have been compiled in around the late 4th century AD. It states that silphium is best served with boiled melon. It is hard to imagine that the author of this cookbook saw silphium as much more than a dish to be eaten for culinary enjoyment. So we can see, okay, we have the medicinal uh, crowd and the food crowd, but I think mostly it was a food item rather than a medicine. So all this importance of silphium actually gives a little bit a doubt, it gives us a doubt of, of, of the fact that the silphium went extinct. I don't think it went extinct. There are Greek medicinal texts written long after the reign of Nero. Remember earlier on when um, Pliny the Elder said the last stock found was sent to Nero as a curiosity? So Greek medical texts writing that it was used as a contraceptive a long time after Pliny's time. So for example, we have a Greek medical writer called Soranos of Ephesus who recommends in his book on uh, gynecology that a woman seeking to induce menstruation should drink an amount of balm made from silphium equivalent to the amount of a chickpea in two glasses of water. Later, a woman doctor named Metrodora, who lived uh, in around the 3rd century AD, includes silphium in a recipe for a abortifacient in her medical treatise on the cures and diseases of women. Neither of these writers mentions anything about the silphium being extinct and we're talking about uh, 200 years later from Pliny. The fact that medical writers from late antiquity keep recommending silphium and mention nothing about it being extinct strongly indicates to me that silphium probably did not go extinct in the first century AD as Pliny the Elder has led many modern scholars to assume. In fact, perhaps people eventually forgot which plant it was. So that leads us to the question, why did it disappear when it was so pricey popular? Obviously, there are many theories and speculations as to what really was the downfall of this plant. But obviously, its popularity seems to be the main reason. So vast sums of money were made by whoever controlled the trade of it. And that's something we can see parallels with today. Something with something like petrol or diamonds or all these precious metals. So valuable was for Romans that the state treasury stored it alongside gold and silver, allegedly. So in the highly interconnected Roman world, it was a very prominent ingredient. But very importantly, it was a wild plant, a wild plant with no known means of cultivation. And if it was overgrazed, then that most likely contributed massively to its demise and alleged disappearance at least from the menus of the Romans. Paul Polaro and Paul Robertson of the University of New Hampshire say in their research, which uh, is published in Frontiers in Conservation Science, shows that the urban growth and accompanying deforestation changed the local microclimate where the silphium grew. 
according to them, the climate was changing, and no matter how much was harvested, silphium was going to go extinct anyway. So deforestation changed the rainfall patterns, causing greater erosion on the hillsides where silphium grew, which Polaro said was confirmed by excavations at the Hawaftea cave near Benghazi. Silphium's microclimate was ruined and it disappeared quite rapidly. And in a way, silphium's value was the cause of its own decline, Polaro said. Without silphium, Serene's economy wouldn't have grown so much in the first place. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbian Creek, UK's leading supplier of premium Greek produce, wine, herbs, cheeses, or olive oil. From all over the wild corners of the country and working directly with small artisanal producers. There are many Greek herbs to enhance your dinner plate. King amongst them is oregano, and Malbian Creek has the best organic oregano from Mount Parnonas in the Arcadia region of the Peloponnese. Ancient Greeks thought oregano made the mountains glow. Hippocrates, an illustrious ancient Greek doctor, was accustomed to choose oregano for the treatment of many diseases. But you can use it in sauces, tomato salads, and on meats on your barbecue. You can also try something a little different, savory, which is another strong pungent mountain herb, great in salads with olives and oranges, but also delicious with grilled lamb or mutton. Whatever you need, Malbian Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the exquisite goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art 17, Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermond in London. Malby Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. And for you dear listeners, you can get a serious 15% discount if you go to malbyandgreek.com slash delicious and use that to get 15% off your next purchase. Now there's a claim that uh, some modern day species like the giant Tangier fennel, Ferula tingitana, or the giant fennel, Ferula communis, could be candidates for the Silphium's modern day identity. And a recent study in 2021 identified a new species, Ferula drudeana, which seems to be a promising candidate for silphium, matching the features depicted on coins, as well as ancient descriptions of the plant. There are many species of giant fennel plants, native to North Africa today, that look very much like the silphium plants of ancient Cyrenaic coins. There is an intriguingly real possibility that one of these extinct species in the genus Ferula may actually be silphium, which would be very, very exciting. And particularly, Ferula tingitana is often cited as a plant that most closely resembles the plant shown on the coins. Now, importantly, central to this botanical riddle is the fact that the silphium couldn't be farmed. But why couldn't be farmed? The herb stamped even the most enthusiastic plant geek of the day, Theophrastus. Widely known as the father of botany, this Greek author was best friends with another giant of, uh, of the ancient world, Aristotle, the father of biology. And he wrote extensively about the characteristics of all plants, though he didn't understand why it couldn't be cultivated either. He observed that um, silphium plants, they tended to grow best on land which had been dug up the previous year. So after attempting to grow silphium in Europe, Greeks and Romans wondered if their land might be missing a humor necessary to nourish it. And there's another uh, issue here. Silphium could have been a mongrel. So when the Greeks tried to grow it from a seed, the result could have been uh, barely recognizable or even sterile. Theophrastus described the plants as having thick roots covered in black bark. They were extravagantly long. If you were to hold one up against the human body, it would be around the distance from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, which is an ancient unit of measurement known as cubit. Though the plant was most peculiar, he said, it had a hollow stalk, a bit like fennel, and golden leaves which resemble those of celery. So, is this it? Are we doomed not to try any of the silphium recipes? As we've seen earlier, Strabo makes mention of another mythic silphium. This is our saviour, from Asia, and luckily for us. This silphium 
it was most likely introduced to the Greeks and the wider Western Mediterranean world as a spice by the soldiers of Alexander the Great. Some authors of this time treated the Middle Eastern plant as if they were identical to the Cyrenic one. Others, unsurprisingly, report that this silphium from Media and Parthia was much less valuable than the stuff from Cyrene. Given the liberal substitutions in Asian markets, it's possible that these products weren't pure silphium and hence less strong and pungent than the one from Cyrene. The Persian or Parthian or Medic silphium still exists today. And that's what we know, or you will know, as asafoetida. Asafoetida is the resin of the plant Ferula asafoetida, a relative to fennel. The aroma and flavor of asafoetida can be compared with that of leek and garlic. It is a strong concentrated flavor, which typically I enjoy cooking with, but even, even I, I can find it very overpowering in my dishes. It needs a light hand. And if you use it correctly, it's of course delicious. It is commonly found in Indian cuisine, nowadays in the past hundreds of years, and you may see it referred in Hindi as hing. Asafoetida has a fetid smell and a nauseating taste if one tastes it raw as a powder, characteristics that also burden it with the name Devil's Dunk. In the Middle Ages, a small piece of gum was worn around the neck to ward off diseases such as cold and fevers. Obviously, whatever the effectiveness it has uh, <laughs> as a cure, uh, it, it was probably due to the antisocial properties of the <laughs> of the amulet rather than any medicinal medicinal virtue. Having worn that around your neck, you definitely kept people uh, uh, in safe distance. And maybe that's something we should do with um, uh, today and today's um, cities. Surprisingly, in Persia, asafoetida was used as a condiment and it was called the food of the gods. This herb is the major component in the famous Ayurvedic herbal formula Hingashtak, and the Sanskrit name is Hing. In Persia, this herb was so highly esteemed as a condiment, and it was mixed almost in all their dishes. As we've seen, Asafoetida is native to Central Asia, like Eastern Iran and Afghanistan, and today it's grown chiefly there, from where it is exported to the rest of the world. It is not native to India, but has been used in Indian medicine and cooking for ages. As a plant is a perennial, flowering and largely grows in the wild. It thrives in dry soil in temperatures under 35 degrees Celsius. So Indians, tropical plateaus and plains, and humid coasts and heavy monsoons rule out much of the country of hink farming. Instead, Indians rely on imports mostly from Afghanistan, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Although the Persians once called it the foods of the gods, hing is now barely found in cuisines outside India. In other parts of the world, it is either used for medicinal reasons or as an insecticide. But in India, which by some estimates accounts for 40% of the world's hing consumption, it's hard to overstate its role in the kitchen. So all in all, the kings and rulers of Cyrene controlled the trade of silphium and wanted to keep their monopoly, selling it for silver. It was their major economic resource for nearly six centuries, until the Romans annexed the region and absorbed it in their uh, empire. It was so valuable that Julius Caesar stashed more than half a ton in his treasury. Nevertheless, it is certain that an amount was smuggled to the Carthaginians and Carthage became a supplier of silphium to some extent. But what about uh, pre-Greeks and Romans? Was the commercial source well developed for these large-scale trading practices? Obviously, we won't know for sure. We will never know for sure. But there is even some fragmented evidence in my known pictograms that suggest the presence of silphium production in the late Bronze Age. Since the natural habitat of the silphium plant was near Egypt, one might wonder about the awareness of ancient Egyptians regarding the presence and medicinal values of the silphium plant. Indeed, there is some archaeological and linguistic evidence indicating that ancient Egyptians knew about silphium and used it in Egyptian rituals, such as the renewal of the king's figure in the Old Kingdom. 
as we've seen, ancient Romans rather loved it. There are a number of recipes in Apicius Cooker book that you can try. I also cook a, a roast hair dish, or rabbit if you can find hair, which has a red wine sauce, a safetida powder, onions, celery seeds, lavage, rue and garum, which is the other ubiquitous uh, uh, ingredient of the ancient Mediterranean. A hearty lentil stew with asafoetida was a big hit as well. And surprisingly, this spice also worked really well with fish. I made a baked mackerel dish in which I split the fish down the middle and sprinkled it with uh, asafoetida, fresh oregano and fresh uh, goat's cheese pressed down on the flesh of the fish and bake it for 20 minutes on 180 degrees Celsius. Two years ago, scientists in India planted 800 saplings of the plant Asafoetida in La Haul and Spiti, a cold desert nestled in the Himalayan mountains, exactly two years after Indian's Council of Scientific and Industrial Research imported six varieties of seeds from Iran. Dr. Ashok Kumar said uh, that they are confident it will work, and he painstakingly germinated the seeds in the lab. And he said this was necessary because for every hundred seeds, only two sprout. The plant, it turns out, has a vexing habit of going dormant. It goes to sleep to adapt to harsh conditions, Dr. Kumar says. As you see, even today, silphium or asafoetida is really, really difficult to, to grow. And yeah, it's no surprise that the ancients um, couldn't cultivate it. If even today we cannot really work how to make it grow. So, asafoetida is a raisin-like extract from a plant of the celery family, native to Iran and Afghanistan. And Kandari uh, Hing is thought to be the best in the world. Food historian K.T. Achaya claims it finds mention in Mahabharata as a spice for meats. So in India, it's one of the most interesting but lesser known uh, spices. And basically, traditionally, it's the one that you use instead of onion and garlic. All over northern India, the hing or asafoetida is the substitute for onion and garlic. Uh, the aromatic compounds in hing are very similar to a certain sulfur compounds in, in the garlic and onion. One of the most uh, intriguing uh, and perhaps mythological food tales around asafoetida has to do with Worcestershire sauce commercially made in, in England and it's been made since the 19th century. Someone claimed to have got the recipe from a governor of the Bengal called Marcus Sandis, who actually doesn't exist. So the documented recipe has fermented anchovies, vinegar, molasses, sugar, salt, tamarind, onion, garlic, and what they call, in quote-unquote, spice and flavorings, which went unnamed until 2009, when a company employee ostensibly came across a diary that noted this as cloves, soy, essence of lemons, peppers and pickles. And the last thing is interesting, pickles. For centuries before, asafoetida was popularly thought to be one of the mysterious spices. Pickle in the list may be a confirmation, or maybe not, who knows. But in any case, it does give you a big, bold, umami-like flavor in your food. Asafoetida. So, who knows? Maybe asafoetida is uh, your secret ingredient for your delicious dal or your Bloody Mary. Hey, who knows? Okay, I've got the jar here with um, asafoetida. Let's uh, open it. And let me have uh, a smell. Ooh, can already smell it. Oh. Oh. Very, very powerful. Very, very powerful smell. Ooh. It's it's like a, a heavy leek uh, or garlic. Not even garlic, no, no, onion. Mostly onion. Like a heavy onion smell. Ooh. Wow. But also something else. Yeah, I don't know. Like a dried celery seeds or something as well. Yeah, it's quite, quite powerful. Uh, yeah, this yellow powder is whew, it's something else. You definitely don't want to put too much of that on your food. Okay, I'm going to try some uh, raw.
Mm, very bitter. Okay. Wow. Wow. Bitter, 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 bitter. Yeah, you just need to heat it up in some oil, in some fat, and then cook food in it. Ooh. Mmm. Yuck. Great. So I've promised you a few recipes with uh, asafoetidum on this episode. Here's my favorite one. I've recreated it a few times for some of my feasts. I think this one is perfect for Sunday lunch or, of course, uh, a dinner with some guests, preferably some close friends. It calls for a marinated goat kid or lamb in milk, honey, asafoetida and black pepper. So kid goat, obviously, it's really tasty, but not very well known here in UK. But if you go to Cabrito Goat Meat, you can find some really nice goat. Or if you go to places like uh, Turner George, for example, they occasionally have some goat. So yeah, I will recommend goat for sure. Or you have lamb. And then you marinate this in milk, honey, asafoetida and black pepper. So this is uh, one of the few Apicius recipes. You remember Apicius, our uh, Roman Gourmand and the Book of Apicius, which uh, gives us quantities. So generally, the recipes from Apicius don't have quantities. Generally, the recipes are very um, vague in terms of um, how long it takes, how you cook it, and so on. Just give you some very general instructions, but no specific quantities. This one, the marinated kid goat, gives us though. And these uh, quantities are given to us in Latin as sectarius, which uh, is roughly equivalent to a pint. Uh, and that said to be 546 ml. So that's one sixth of a congius of a Roman unit of volume in liquid measure, or one eighth amphora. The imperial pint uh, of uh, 568 ml is what we use in UK today. Okay, so let's get roughly two kilograms of uh, leg of lamb or kid on the bone. Get a big pot or a container that you can fit it in together with a liquid marinade. So heat some milk, about a pint or 570 ml. Warm it just enough so the honey can dissolve. How much honey you want to put is up to you, but about 50 to 70 grams uh, should be enough. Sweeter will give us a recipe closer to the Roman uh, taste buds and the Roman palate. Once you dissolve the honey and the milk and honey is cooled down, add 30 grams of black pepper, black pepper which you've toasted and then you grind it to a powder, and then some salt, plus a teaspoon of asafoetida. Pour the marinade all over the meat. Make sure that this, this divine liquid is covering the whole uh, leg and has uh, reached every crevice of the meat and is bathed like a queen, properly in milk and honey. Now let it absorb all the flavor overnight. Next day, soak a handful of dates in some red wine for a few hours. We will be making a sauce to go with our meat. Now remove the meat from the marinade, pat it dry and rub with good olive oil and salt. Roast the leg as you normally do, um, as you would like it. So make sure the joint first of all is at room temperature. So take it out of the fridge one hour before cooking. Preheat the oven at uh, 190 degrees Celsius. Place an oven tray in the preheated oven for uh, about one hour and 20 minutes if the joint if the leg of lamb or the kid is 1.5 kilograms or for 2 hours and 15 minutes if it's a 3 kilogram joint. Once it's cooked, rest uncovered on a warm plate and not too hot to touch for at least 20 minutes before serving. So for the leg of a kid goat, uh, you can cover it with a tin foil and place it in a hot oven for 20 minutes and then turn down the heat to medium for approximately another 2 hours. Halfway through, Turn it over. Now prepare the sauce in a pan. Crush the soaked dates to a pulp. Add 280 ml of red wine, 60 mg of olive oil and 60 g of honey and 60 g of fish sauce. Bring to boil. Let it reduce a little and thicken if you want with some flour. To serve, make some bulgur. Obviously potatoes or rice didn't exist in antiquity, okay? 
Carve thick slices of the mouth-watering, sticky roasted joint and serve with sauce on the side and a generous amount of bulgur. A second recipe is a salad and an unusual one for that. It's a fantastic winter cabbage with asafoetida and coriander leaves. This is served with a famous oximile, the ancient sauce. Medical writers of antiquity popularized it uh, as a good dietary advice to have because it cured headaches and stomach upsets, apparently. This delicious recipe goes uh, something like this. A small cabbage, finely sliced with a sharp knife. Wash and drain. Put aside. Make the honey and vinegar concoction by boiling 120 grams of honey, then add 30 milligrams of red wine vinegar and reduce a little. Let it cool. Chop fresh coriander, nice and bright green, and mix it with two tablespoons of golden extra virgin olive oil. Add a teaspoon of dried roux and mix all that with the cabbage. Sprinkle some salt and pinches of asafoetida. Then dress it with three to four tablespoons of honey vinegar mix, which is our oximile. And this is it. Thank you for joining me for another adventure. I hope it was uh, delicious as usual and you found intriguing the history of uh, Silphium. It's, um, is it, has it disappeared? Has it gone due to human uh, behavior? Or is still with us? And uh, we just forgotten about it here in the West. It's up to you to decide, not up to me. So go on, find some asafoetida and use it in every recipe you do. And tell me what you think about it. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Thank you for listening. We'll be back very soon with another episode about the adventures of herbs and spices in the ancient world. Stay tuned. Have a lovely week.